Welcome everybody. Again, apologies for the tardiness, but uh, we'll kick off now. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Steve Godbold. I'm an ALM consultant based here in Sydney. Uh, I've lived in Sydney for about two years, uh, minus a short stint over in Seattle. Um, I've been in IT now for about 10 years, a uh, little bit over. I don't like to say too much about how much over because it makes me feel a little bit old. <laughs> um, I said three decades. Three decades, yeah. yeah. Um, so, my passion in the uh, in the industry is uh, continuous delivery. I, in my job, try and help companies or help companies deliver value to their customers as fast as they can. Um, and I love to focus on the process side of continuous delivery. So. What I've found is that a lot of the talks that we see these days on continuous delivery focus a lot on the practices, on the technical pieces that go towards uh, delivering a continuous delivery pipeline. Uh, and not a lot of them mention the foundations of continuous delivery, the process side of things, where it is actually based in and the thinking that's behind it. So all that lean thinking, etc. So what I'd like to do tonight is have a bit of a chat about how process impacts continuous delivery, what kind of things you can expect depending on the process you're using, and what kind of things you can do to improve your process to get more out of your continuous delivery efforts. Uh, the way we're going to do this is, I'm going to start off with, uh, actually before I go into it, how many of you guys are developers? That's what I expected. <laughs> so everybody here's a dev, cool, All right, I won't bother asking the other two questions then. Um, but we'll start off with why you should care about process as a developer. So taking a look at how process impacts you and uh, as a Ninja developer why it's important to care about the things around you. We'll then do a quick definition of continuous delivery just to scope the conversation for tonight. Uh, we'll then look at how two of our common process models impact the ability of continuous delivery to, to uh, be helpful for you. So we'll take a look at a, a waterfall model and an agile model. Um, and what they bring to the table in terms of continuous delivery. And then once we've gone over those, we'll take a look at how we can take either of those models and improve them in a scientific manner so that we get more out of that continuous delivery effort. Then we'll wrap up with some questions and I was gonna say sushi, but I think you've already had it. So it's all good. All right, so being that you're all uh, .NET ninjas in here, um, you're all great at what you do, uh, why should you care about process? What does it really matter? I mean, you guys cut code. In fact, you do better than cut code. You take your Ninja Blade to it and you absolutely slice and dice it. Um, you take shurikens to databases and you drop smoke bombs on service layers. Why do you care about the process that sits around your code or that sits around your efforts? First of all, a real ninja is aware of their surroundings. You can't surprise a ninja. They know everything about what goes on around them. They know when the work is coming. They know when their team members are struggling. And software delivery is all about how much you as a team can get out, not you as an individual. A high-performing team will always outperform a high-performing individual. So being aware of your surroundings forms part of your ability to be a ninja. And what that means is knowing your process, knowing the policies, and knowing how to maximize your, your effectiveness within those policies. The second reason is ninjas influence their situation. So if you do happen to surprise a ninja, they'll then influence the situation so that it's then to their advantage afterwards. So for example, if our process is not giving us everything we need, we'll, because we know about our surroundings, because we know about our processes, our policies, how they work, what they're intended to do, we can influence that process and policy to better suit our needs and to better suit our business needs and get more out of it. Finally, girls like ninja skills. And uh, what we need to be aware of is we need to make the most of ni as ninjas of everything around us so that we can maximize our chances of girls or guys liking our ninja skills. Um, for those of you, does everybody know who that is in the middle? Napoleon. No, yeah, nobody, everybody's seen Napoleon Dynamite? Yeah. I was tempted if that joke had flopped to do a version of his dance that he does at the end of it, but well, luckily. Well, I forget it, so you can forget it. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no. Uh, the video won't cope with it. Uh, I'll have to stay behind the podium. Sorry. 
So waterfall again kind of falls short in its handover process in reducing the risk there. Uh, by reducing the ability, uh, reducing the possibility of unknown change, you can follow good source control practices with waterfall. There's no real limitation there. Um, the the change control process is the, the biggest risk because, and the risk with it is that you move off in a direction that isn't the one your customer wants, and you introduce failure demand in that you haven't delivered the value that the customer expected and there's a lot of value left on the table there that you then have to come back and deliver later. Um, so, all in all, probably a one or two out of ten in terms of managing risk and I think this is shown fairly extensively through the number of projects that go over, etc. Q quoting of the uh, Standish Chaos Report um, with these kind of processes. So how does it deal with cycle time? Well, as I said, the history proves it fairly extensively. Uh, cycle time is fairly variable in a, uh, in a waterfall project. Essentially, as long as it takes you to deliver the system is your cycle time, the whole system. From an internal perspective, you can be, well, I've been left pretty unsatisfied by a waterfall process. Uh, I've been a developer on a, on a waterfall project. I've sat there for three months and not seen a single thing get into the hands of a user. Uh, my goal as a software developer is to get things into the hands of the user and see a smile on their face. If I can't do that, I'm not really satisfied. Um, in terms of an external perspective or a customer perspective, again, not really satisfying. We can take anywhere between three to six years to deliver a piece of software. So overall, again, with our cycle time, not a particularly high mark, maybe a two out of 10 here. How does this add up to our competitive advantage? Essentially, we don't really get too much of a competitive advantage here. Now, I'm gonna stop for a second and clarify. I don't mean when I, I spell these out, don't use continuous delivery practices within a waterfall process. Uh, they will still bring you a lot of benefit. They will still give you a lot of good things. What they won't do is give you as much as they possibly can um, because they'll be artificially limited by the process itself. Um, essentially, if you have a continuous delivery pipeline within a waterfall process, what you'll find is that you have a fighter jet capability uh, technically that you then limit to the output cadence of a sp uh, Spitfire. So we take it back 40 or 50 years and that's what we've got. Thankfully, in the 40 years since Waterfall was first defined, we've evolved a little bit. We've come from the days of strict regimes of change control and management to understanding that change happens. Uh, what we define at the start of the process isn't always what the customer actually wants and we need to deal with that. Uh, the Agile movement was spawned. Now, out of the Agile movement came everybody's favorite process today, Scrum. How many of you guys do Scrum? How many? Leave your hand up if you do Scrum with a capital S. As in you do exactly the handbook version of Scrum. Nobody. That's about the average response. Um, so Scrum's a, a process first defined by Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland uh, at the UFSA conference back in 95 actually. So a little bit older than uh, their official history proclaims. And it was born out of the observation of these guys that really the reductionist view doesn't make sense in terms of software development and in terms of people. We learn best by trying something, observing how the system reacts to it, and then moving on in another direction based on that reaction. This is an empirical process um, control theory. Uh, essentially, we, we build knowledge based on the environment in which we operate. So the more we do, the more we know. Out of this came this diagram. You've all seen it a thousand times, I'm sure. Uh, but Scrum is basically, we have a bunch of work we need to do. We take some of it. We give it to some people that we know about. They run over it for a period of time. And out of the end some, comes something that we can potentially put into production. This sounds pretty close to what continuous delivery is trying to achieve. How does it, though, help us with our continuous delivery practices? As I said, it, uh, it takes a known number of people and a known set of work and it puts them in a container or a box. And so it limits that time frame then as well down to 30 days. So what's our exposure to risk? About 30 days using the classical 
uh, diagram time frame. I've seen teams come down to a week, uh, which obviously results in a much smaller batch size, which gives you that ability to reduce and be more effective in managing the risk. Uh, your teams are amorphous, so they're, they're basically everybody lumped in together in Scrum, which increases that ta tacit knowledge as continuous delivery tries to do. Uh, and you're allowed to self-organize and do what you need to get together across the line. Um, the furthest we go also um, in terms of how far we can deviate from customer expectation, furthest we go is that seven to 30 day period uh, that our delivery cycle lasts for. So we're reducing that ability to move off track, we're reducing the batch size, we're doing much better in terms of managing the risk. Uh, so Scrum's not too bad in terms of risk management. How does it do in terms of reducing our cycle time? Well, our cycle time is really whatever we define as the length of our sprint, right? Uh, from an internal perspective, work can be delivered fairly quickly. We can get a product backlog item to use the terms in the Scrum template uh, for Team Foundation Server. We can get a PBI across the line pretty quickly. Uh, it could be a day, it could be two days, just depends on the size, those kind of things. They don't go to production until the end of the, the sprint technically, if you follow the guidance as it's spelled out. Uh, but you can get stuff done and you can get a fairly good uh, sense of achievement from watching it progress across your board. Uh, a single time box is generally your maximum delivery length, so you've only got seven days. So you can turn things around for your customers fairly quickly as well. Where Scrum falls a little bit short in terms of dealing with delivery times or cycle times is for failure demand. So defects that appear within the process, within the time box, it deals with really well. It's not done until it's done. Right? So if we have a bug, fix it. What happens though when we ship that software and Snoopy here goes onto our site and he buys something, maybe a pair of new socks or some ear warmers, and he puts in his credit card details and finds that when his bank statement, when it comes in, that somebody else has gone and hijacked his credit card details from our site and gone and bought a whole lot of dodgy stuff across a whole lot of dodgy stores on the internet. He's not real happy, so he sits down and writes us a letter and we get that letter and we say, oh, that's a pretty important bug, we need to fix it. But we're in the middle of a sprint, what do we do? According to the guide, we have two options. The first thing we do is we put it at the top of the product backlog because it's the most important thing. We then can either cancel our sprint and immediately start work on this item in the new sprint. The problem is if we cancel our sprint, we've got inventory. How do we deal with that inventory? What do we do with it? There's a whole range of questions and answers that fall around that area. I think with the extension of Scrum that's now available, that body of knowledge that's going to build up there, we'll start to answer some of those questions. But a lot of people tend to drift off into these unproven theories that they have themselves, some good, some bad, uh, generally untried and untested though. Uh, the other option is that we wait until the end of the sprint, ship our current inventory, pick it up in the next sprint and roll on with it. The problem here is, if we've got a 14 day sprint, so let's say two weeks, which is kind of the average of what I see now, people are erring towards two weeks. If we're halfway through, we've got a seven day period, and then another 14 days on top of that before we deliver. So our cycle time's one and a half, at most kind of two sprint lengths before we can get that out. So we're not really getting that out as quickly as we could. And uh, in the case of Snoopy getting his credit card details hijacked, it's probably pretty unacceptable. Now, of course, that's if you stick to the guide. Um, there are exceptions. We all make them in terms of Scrum. I'm not saying it's right or wrong to make the exceptions or not, just that we do. Okay, so how does Scrum enable our competitive advantage? Uh, it does a pretty good job. We're going to do much better than a lot of waterfall teams. How do Scrum teams compare to each other? Well, that depends really on the tweaks that they make and how they make those tweaks to the Scrum process. Now you guys have all tweaked the Scrum process for your organization. How many of you did that on the back of knowledge about exactly what was happening within the process? So did you have a metric that you drove your change off? No? Nobody had a, a particular metric they drove their change off? No? Was there just something that wasn't working for you and you, so you decided to tweak it a little bit so it worked a bit better for you? Yeah? There's a couple of nods. Okay. So, generally, uh, the process that I've seen for changing Scrum is, this sucks, let's, let's do that instead. 
and it'll happen in discussion. There'll be a bit of discussion about it. You'll probably find a meeting or two. Um, at the end of that, the outcome will be that you change. When you change, not a lot of people go back and say, okay, so we've changed now. Are we better or are we worse? How has this improved our throughput in terms of our delivery capability, etc.? What's wrong with not measuring that? Well, you don't really know if you've got better. It's a gut feel, it's an instinct thing. So if a lot of scrum butt comes from instinct, what can we do? How do we deal with this? How do we make ourselves better scientifically so that we have proof that we're better? Uh, for example, what if we could reduce the batching? What if we could reduce, remove those barriers, those, those constraints or policies that Scrum puts in place and say that we can deliver anything to production at any time as long as it's deemed ready. Would that be better or worse? We're not really looking for another process here. Our Scrum bot efforts aren't uh, an effort at another process. It's just a better way to do Scrum or a better way to do waterfall if you're in a waterfall environment, for example. Actually, how many of you waterfall guys have modified from the classical definition? Yeah. You've got iterate, uh, iterative waterfall now. That's Wagile. Wagile. <laughs> I haven't heard Wagile before. I like that one. Okay, yeah, concocts all kinds of nasty images in my head, but we'll go with it, Wagile. Okay, so how do we change and how do we do it scientifically? How many of you guys have heard of the Kanban method? Now, I have to apologize early in the piece for alternating between Kanban and Kanban. I'll get it wrong, I'll pronounce it wrong. Uh, the core thing is remember those three words. Um, they are what you need to know. Okay, so the Kanban method is an incremental evolutionary change management process geared towards changing process. So it's about knowing what you do. So using your existing process, taking Scrum or Waterfall or whatever it is you do already and understanding it, first of all. Then committing to getting better at doing it. Uh, incrementally and evolutionary changing that process so that it suits your need more. Uh, and unlike other agile methods, it doesn't preach a systematic change. You don't have to go and change your organization. You don't have to change the roles you perform. If you're a project manager, you're a project manager. You don't have to become a scrum master overnight to fulfill what Kanban uh, requires of you. Uh, so those, those are the three guiding lights in Kanban. Use your existing process, commit to change, and use your existing roles and responsibilities. Don't change the people, don't change the organization, don't change the process. Start with what you know. There's then five practices and tools that sit within Kanban to help us evolve. The first of which is visualize. How many of you guys have some kind of board that shows you where your work is and how it's going? Yeah, a couple of guys, a couple of scrum boards out there. I was hoping there'd be a whiteboard in here, but there isn't. I was going to evolve a scrum board into a Kanban board for you. Uh, but th so this is roughly what a scrum board looks like. A whole lot of to-do doing done. The difference between a scrum board or a primary difference between a scrum board and a, a Kanban board is that scrum, because of the way it organizes that middle part of work, the doing piece, where everybody just kind of swarms on it, we get it done no matter what role we're fulfilling at the time, it is a big fat doing phase. There isn't any distinction between this is now in development, this is now in test, this is now in user acceptance, now we're done. What Kanban does is it says go and understand what you actually do. So if you're not a self-organizing team, which a lot of teams actually aren't, don't pretend on your board like you're a self-organizing team and like you do everything at once. If you have phases within your process, map the phases onto the board and make it represent your reality so that you can see the work flow through the system. Um, the other difference is that work is pulled through the system. So if we do have those phases and we have, uh, for example, a dev then a test progression, if a developer finishes a piece of work, they don't get to throw it at the tester and say, this is done, go which is fairly common in a lot of your standard processes. If I'm done as a dev, I then mark the work items ready for test and just push it over to them. It's their problem now. Um, that in a waterfall process is equivalent to moving between the transitions or steps. We've got a whole bunch of work and we're just going to say test, it's yours to deal with now, whether they have the capacity or not. Um, what it does is it moves to a pool-based system. And a pool-based system means that I as a tester get to decide when I take that work. Do I have the capability or the capacity to do it right now? Yes? Cool. I'll take that on and get it done. 
What this means is that we have a lot less inventory or waste within the system. So we've got a lot less work in progress naturally because once we get to the point at which I'm done and if you can't take it, then I just have to hold on to it for now. It's a project management nightmare from a traditional perspective, but we'll talk about why that's effective shortly. Okay, so how do we get started with a Kanban board? The first thing we need to do is define the start and end point to the board. So ultimately we want to bring in the BAs or the, the spec writers. Ultimately we want to have the testers and the, the ops guys in there as well. We want to bring every, everybody into this board and understand how work flows through the entire system. Reality, some people don't want to work with it. That's fine. We define the board start and end points at the points we can control. If something moves out of our control, keep it off the board because we can't manage the flow of it. What we need to do though is if, if it does move off the board is come up with some explicit contracts as to how that's going to work. This is how our system works. When you give us work, it needs to look like this and needs to have these attributes so that we can use it effectively. When we hand you work, what do you need? So we can make sure that at the end of this board, at this done point, that we've got all those things done so that when we hand them off to the ops guys, for example, it's all ready to go according to their definition. So once we've defined our start and end point, we uh, set up our board. The way we set up our board is to do a value chain map. So literally, if you want, a pencil, a piece of paper, and talk to a lot of people about how work goes through their particular phase of the process. Uh, we then, as part of that, need to know what kinds of work we do. So everybody does different kinds of work. We have a bug, we have a, a, a work item, a general normal feature, for example, that we do. There might be um, issues or risks that get raised and progress through this in terms of resolution. We all do different kinds of work. We need to know about those kinds of work as well because they have different expectations, different delivery uh, timelines, etc., different expectations. Uh, once we've defined those, which are our classes of service, we can go on to understand the demand for those classes of service. So how much work do we get that is general uh, feature delivery, for example? So 80% our work features and 20% bugs? Or is it the other way around, which is probably more likely in most cases? Um, once you know how much of each of these pieces of, or types of work you do, you can start to develop um, SLAs around how much of that work you're going to work on at any one time. Um, and we'll talk about that in the policies section that comes a little bit later on. So again, the Kanban board, the, difference, the main differences are we have classes of service, we have um, reality represented up there regardless of whether we like it or not, uh, and we use a pool-based mechanism for bringing work through the system. The second thing we do is start to limit work in progress. Or Again, this is somewhere I'll vary. I'll say progress or process for the P, but essentially the same meaning. It's anything you're doing at, at that point in time. Now, limiting work in process sounds kind of counterintuitive. If we're doing less at the same time, then we're getting less out, right? It's, it's fairly anecdotally known that the more you do, the longer it takes to do something. So the more you're doing it once, the longer it takes to get one of those things done. There is actually mathematical evidence that backs this. There's a law in queuing theory called Little's Law, a very simple law uh, that it deals primarily with um, arrival rates, cycle time and throughput. But what it shows is the relationship between directly the amount of things you do and how much you can get done. So this is Little's Law applied to an Excel graph, very, very simple one. You can see that as we increase our work in process, our cycle time or the amount of things we can get done, or sorry, the amount of time it takes to get something done on average, increases along with it. What this graph shows us, even though it's very simple, is that we half the work in process, or halve, sorry, we also halve the cycle time. So we get things done twice as fast by reducing the work in process by two. Uh, it's a pretty simplistic graph, but it gives you that relationship fairly strongly. Um, the other thing it does is if you reduce work in process, you'll also start to expose the problems in your system. So for in the example I used earlier where I've got a developer, they've finished their work, the tester's testing away and they've reached their work in process limit, they can't take the piece of work from the developer. And that work will start to back up until the development hit their work in process limit as well and we'll see that test is becoming a bottleneck or a constraint on the flow of our system. We'll then have to go and do something about it because 
things will back up back all the way back to the end of the system and our board will show it. Um, that exposition allows us to, with the information that we have, go and argue a case for improving our test capability in some way. Now, um, we'll talk about the strategies for improving those capabilities shortly and dealing with bottlenecks, etc. Uh, but for now, let's just say that we hire two more testers. Usually the worst way to increase capability, but that's how we'll do it for now. So we can go hire two more testers and we can let that flow. Now, our work in process limits exist on the system as a whole, and they also exist on each column of the board. So we have our, our development column, our test column, our uh, UAT column, for example. We go and put a limit on how many things that we can have in those columns at any one time. Usually, uh, as a start point, I use the number of people we have times two as our whip limit. Uh, the reason I use times two is because you need to take into account that sometimes something will get blocked for a reason that's a very short term reason. So for example, I'll get blocked because I'm waiting on a particular database deployment that's currently in progress. That'll take an hour, I need something to work on for an hour, I'll take a task, I'll start working on it. Any more than two is becoming counterproductive because we're starting to hit that whip limit heading up and our cycle time starts to drop. So there's that trade-off between giving people enough work and making sure that we're not limiting or oh, increasing our cycle time too much. Uh, and that is only a starting point. Whip limits are adjustable completely depending on how you see your system working. The third, and so there's five of these, the first three are the really important ones. The last two are important, but if you can get these first three working, you'll get most of the benefit of Kanban. Uh, the third part is to manage flow. So don't manage utilization. Don't manage how busy people are. Um, making a developer more busy, uh, it's a really bad way to phrase it, making a developer busier if they're not the bottleneck in the system actually decreases the performance of the system directly because they just back more work up against the bottleneck. What this allows us to do is identify, well, it allows us to do a number of things, but this is a, a really simple cumulative flow diagram. Each of these colored sections represent a state in our uh, process, with the top here being in progress, uh, sorry, to do, doing done. So this is a really, really simple one. If we have more states, so let's say we had um, another to do here, this was our dev state, this was our test state, this was our done state. What we could see is, we can actually directly measure our work in process here. So the distance between two lines is the work in process in that column at that point in time. So 27 and 12, 15 works, work items in process at this point in time. What you can also do here though is by drawing a horizontal line across the graph. So using the two sevens in the opposite bottom corner here, uh, we can work out the average uh, cycle time for a work item in the system. So that took uh, two weeks for the to-do line to get to the same level, sorry, the done line to get to the same level that the to-do line was at, both at seven. So our cycle time is on average two weeks for a work item as it comes into our system and goes out. That's, they're, they're the basic stats that you can use this, this kind of diagram to get. You can then see your cycle time, you can see your, your work in process. You can also manage flow by watching the thickness of these state lines or the, the gap between them. Now, the fat uh, line uh, means, sorry, I think of the right way to word this. If you see a fat section, so see how this is increasing here. Let's assume that's our, our dev work in process. This is our test work in process. Make it a little bit thinner. Um, what you'll notice is if this starts to get fat, the problem isn't actually in that section. So dev's not being uh, dev is not the bottleneck if the work starts to pile up there. It's actually the upstream process, so the test process in that case is the bottleneck again because the work's backing up in the dev as they complete it. Um, how do we fix this? Again, there's a couple of ways. Because we're managing flow, we're really managing how smoothly that work runs through the system. The smoother it moves through, the, the better our cycle time and our throughput will be. Sorry, uh, the better our throughput will be, it might negatively impact our cycle time slightly. There's a balance there. Um, where was I going? So, what we want to do is, and I'm trying to think what the, where we were going with this particular piece. Sorry. Improve your testing. 
If you want to improve your testing capability, yes. Um, I'm trying not to step on what I'm going to do later, so I might leave that and talk that, about that in the slide after this one. Okay, so the fourth uh, part is explicit policies. So, very simple, make things very explicit. If you have a policy within your process, spell it out. Make it available on the board, make it available somewhere. A really good uh, version of this, or um, example of this, is actually the SSW rules. How many of you guys seen the rules? Yeah, Adam points you to them every week, right? Yeah, even if you don't work for him. How many of you guys contributed to the rules? Yep, <laughs> yep. Um, so the SSW rules are basically a list of things and, uh, and ways to do them, and they're very, very explicit in how things are done. If you, uh, if you need to do something, you go and look up the rule for it. If you disagree with the rule, the beauty of an explicit policy is that then you objectively challenge the rule. There's no subjective challenge of the rule. There's no emotion involved in it. It's simply that this rule is the way it is. If I don't like it, I come with an argument for it or for changing it, and we assess it on its merit. Uh, explicit policies make it simpler to make decisions about how you will act and, and what you will do within the process. Um, so reduce defects, essentially, by improving consistency. Uh, the last one is to improve collaboratively. So get better as a system. Uh, manage the flow through the system and improve the system as a whole. Uh, this means improving the things that are bottlenecks and not improving the ones that aren't necessarily. Uh, it also means doing so in a scientific fashion and this is where we get back to how we improve our, uh, our scrum or our waterfall effort. Uh, the, there's a bunch of theories on how you do it. Uh, essentially, the goal is to use a model. Uh, so we model out the behavior that we've got on our board, for example. We observe it. We then take that and uh, hypothesize about a solution. So this is where most people get to. We get to, okay, how do we think we can fix that test capability issue? Oh, uh, well, we hire two more testers. That'll fix it, no worries. Uh, the problem with something like hiring two more testers is we get that J does everybody know um, the j-curve of uh, improvement so you make a change your performance will actually decrease briefly at the start of the improvement and then increase as the, you get traction with the improvement or you get better at whatever it is you've changed um, interestingly enough most teams when they try scrum will go down to the bottom of the j-curve and then they'll quit uh, so what this is trying to do, this scientific improvement, is instead of doing a big J-curve like that, starting to develop a lot of small J-curves, similar to how we improve software. You don't go and improve software by deleting 30 classes and then rewriting them all it's because they're not quite OO in the way you liked. You go in and you start to separate them out into interfaces, break the dependencies, change little pieces, do some tests, make sure it's all working. You can do that with our process as well. Uh, it's based, scientific theory is that uh, after we, we get the hypothesis, we go and implement, and then we come back and as part of our hypothesis, we check the metrics that we, we, we check the metrics that we devised as part of our hypothesis. So a hypothesis doesn't just consist of, we want to do this, it consists of, we feel that this will improve our performance by X in this way, and this is how we will measure that. Um, then we come back after we do the experiment and we measure and check. Now those measurements aren't um, fill line measurements, so they're not the kind of measurement where if you had a cup and you drew a line halfway up and you poured water in and the, line went, uh, the water went up past the line of the cup, that's better. They're the kind of measurement where it's like a bullseye or like a target in target shooting. You hit the bullseye, perfect. If you hit anywhere outside the bullseye, you've deviated from the goal and you need to stop. Even if it's more of the goal, it's not necessarily better. You need to come back to that bullseye goal that you set out in the first place. So we need to stop and understand why we deviated, come up with a hypothesis about our next change, and go on from there. Um, that's based out of uh, Deming's PDCA cycle. Uh, the actual theories around this, the ways you can change, uh, theories of, theory of constraints. Anybody heard of theory of constraints before? A guy called Eli Goldratt. Um, I won't say his name right either because I believe he's Israeli and I have no chance of saying any Israeli person I've ever met's name right. 
Um, again, I'm terrible with pronunciation. Theory of constraints is about finding and fixing bottlenecks. So where we found that test constraint, we'd go and ele first elevate the constraint. So realize that it's a constraint and then start to get the most out of it. So we make sure that, for example, uh, our testers are always busy. And we do this by doing something like putting a buffer in front of the testers where devs can continue to put work into that buffer. It has, again, a work in process limit because we're increasing the work of the pro in process for the entire system. It slows down our cycle time. There's a trade-off here. Um, we put work into that buffer so that the testers have something they can always pull work from. Yeah? So they're never idle. If we let the bottleneck be idle, uh, the reason for this is if the bottleneck is ever idle, that's lost time out of the system as an entirety that we can't get back. Uh, so losing time at the bottleneck costs, losing time at a non-constraint doesn't cost. Uh, the second part of this is to uh, decide how to deal with it. Um, so what we want to do is, in the case of our testers, our long-term strategy may be to invest in automation. Our short-term strategy is to start dealing out some of the test work to the developers, for example. We make a risk assessment on the change. We say it's a low-risk assessment. Devs can test it. They just write some automation around it, and off they go. It's a high-risk change. We probably need a test resource, so we'll push something through to the testers there. And we reduce the load on that test bottleneck uh, in the short term. Probably not a good long-term thing, so we invest in the automation to get that long-term over the hump and reduce the bottleneck there. Um, all of these uh, theories are, are cycles. So once you go around once, you continue around the next time to make it even better. So if test with our bottleneck originally, we automate our testing, we come back at the end of the automation cycle and we say, okay, where's the bottleneck now? We start to observe our cumulative flow diagrams again, we look at our board and see where the work is going and how it's flowing find the next, bo next bottleneck, start attacking that. Uh, the second is lean. Everybody who, every, has anybody heard of lean? No. Yeah, Toyota um, production systems, heard of that? Okay, so lean comes out of uh, Toyota, essentially. Um, it's a waste focused uh, method of improvement. Aden essentially we identify waste in the system. There's um, seven types of waste, I believe, traditionally. Uh, this is interesting because it can be misinterpreted. Uh, this can be seen as a developer's idle, that's waste. So let's get him working. It's waste in the system context. So anything that slows down that cycle time again or the throughput. Uh, the final is uh, statistical process control or um, otherwise known in, or also the uh, system of profound knowledge. This is Deming based, uh, Deming or Schuett. And this focuses on reducing the variability in the system. So uh, either we have assignable cause or special cause variation in the system. Uh, special cause is something that, for example, we have a production outage because our server went offline because the building that it was hosted in flooded. It's a special cause variation. There's not much we can do about it except get a server in a fifth floor apartment for example. And then there's uh, standard cause variation, which is the variation within our process because we deviate in slightly in what we do. We can start to deal with that um, and we can find uh, ways through um, observing the models, etc., cetera, to, to deal with that variability and smooth out the flow through the system again. Okay, so if you're interested in any of these, uh, these particular methods, um, the two books, so this is the, the one on the far side from me. The goal is the Ellie Goldratt book. I'd actually start there, that'd be the first book I read. Reason being one, it's not boring. It's actually a business novel. So it teaches you the theory of constraints through a story. Uh, and it's a really great story, really interesting. Um, once you've uh, once you got over theory of constraints, I'd probably move on with the Kanban book. So this is the definitive text on Kanban. This is David J. Anderson's book. Um, if you're on Twitter, his handle is Agile Manager, I believe. Um, I'll check once I'm online. I dare not go online for the uh, risk of one of my friends Skyping me something that because they know I'm presenting that I don't want to share with you. Um, and the, the other book that I'd read, if you're interested in um, Lean, is The Toyota Way, which is 
a story or an observation about how Toyota got to where they are today, uh, one of the world's leading car manufacturers, through improving their processes and defining uh, essentially lean manufacturing. Um, so these are the three resources I'd use, uh, or I have used, uh, as my reading resources. There's a little link down there, an Amazon link to each of them, um, to their purchase pages. You can grab two of them on Kindle. I don't think you can get the Toyota way on Kindle, but the other two come on Kindle. Uh, okay, so that's a fast version of my content. I'm aware that I'm late, so I've run through it fairly quickly. Is there any questions on any of that stuff? No? Any? Have you, yeah. um, have you looked at Scrum Band? Uh, I haven't looked at it explicitly. Whoa. I saw the Telerik guys do a talk. No. Uh, they were at the, the Telerik guys were at last year. Is this Joel? Joel yeah. and, um, well, and Forte, Stephen Forte. Yeah. And they did a talk in the okay. on um, Scrum Band. Yeah. Merging them together, and it was similar. It was the process improvement for Scrum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's it's application of Kanban to Scrum. Yeah, as a means for improving Scrum. Yeah. Uh, so Kanban is really great to improve any process, but it does work really well with Scrum because you naturally have those short feedback cadences that Scrum gives you. So it, it has built in a policy where. Um, you go through one cycle and then you, you grab some feedback. So Scrum automatically gives you that ability to come back and check how you're going in terms of your process improvement as well. So you check the work you're doing in terms of the development output, etc. And also use that as an opportunity to go and check how any process change you're doing has come along in terms of your retrospectives, etc. Uh, any other questions? Thoughts? Musings? No? Okay. Favorite tools? Favorite tools. Um, so if you're using TFS, unfortunately you won't get a cumulative flow diagram out of the box. Do you guys have a cumulative flow diagram in your tools? Uh, yeah. Play, uh, play diagram. So something that gives you this kind of thing. It's not, it's not a burn down chart, it's more just a visual representation of count of work in different states. I think Team Pulse search reporting. So Team Pulse may have that out of the box. None of the process templates do yet. Uh, I submitted a patch to the Scrum for Team System that allow you to start to build some of these reports. I haven't built the reports yet myself and submitted them. Um, but you can get a cumulative flow diagram in it out of TFS. It's fairly simple to get the vanilla version. So just take the states, sum them, and put, plot them on a, a graph. The problem is you need to make sure that they're in this particular order. Uh, if you flip them around, you start to lose the ability to do that um, direct horizontal and vertical assessment of our work in process and our cycle time uh, at a quick glance. Uh, there is a, a visual whip board that sits on top of TFS, so if you want to, um, if your work item state's already mapped to your process directly, uh, there's a tool called Visual Whip that gives you your Kanban board as a digital thing. Uh, I don't know how it goes with tactile surfaces, so for example a touch screen, but uh, I do know that it works quite well with a, a mouse and keyboard, so if you've got a projector and a big board, project the visual whip system up there directly out of TFS. And that, yeah, so that can't, that's just an add-on for TFS? Yeah, 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 yeah. Excellent. yeah. Just runs over the top of the object model. Yep. All right, thanks guys. Before you go, I've got a task for you. Go to tv.ssw.com and subscribe to our newsletter. You'll be informed of all upcoming videos. In addition, if you're super keen, I'm all about inspecting and adapting. So send me an email or send me a tweet at Adam Kogan. Cheers.